On this edition of Independent Sources, Transgender and Jewish, how transgender men and women are coming out and changing some age-old rituals in the Jewish community. Recognizing that this is part of a normal range of variation and then deciding what to do about it is different than where we have been, which is um, communities not even knowing that this was a possibility and reacting with shock and confusion. And autism in a second language, the plight of many Hispanic parents who are already struggling with the disease and how that's being worsened by a language barrier. And that's actually another problem with the, with the Hispanic community. A lot of us just don't have access to health insurance, you know, or you don't know how to fight for the services that your child deserves. Those stories and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources, bringing you news from New York's ethnic and immigrant communities. I'm Zyphus Lebrun. Transgender and Jewish is a new e-book that explores how more Jewish men and women are coming out and speaking out about gender identity in the community. The book is a compilation of stories that were published by the Jewish newspaper, The Forward. I sat down with The Forward's Naomi Zevalov, who edited those stories, and Joy Layden, a transgender professor at Yeshiva University. We talked about the significance of Leiden's acceptance at that orthodox institution and the book's role in highlighting how transgender men and women may be influencing age-old rituals in the Jewish community. Naomi, Joy, thank you very much for being in studio with us. Great to be here. Thank you. Okay. So, Naomi, let's talk a little bit about the book, um, Transgender and Jewish. Um, what, uh, what inspired you guys at the Ford to, uh, to, to produce this book? Um, well, I began looking into the topic many months ago after spending about a year reporting on lesbian and gay inclusion in the non-Orthodox Jewish world. And we learned that non-Orthodox communities had made some significant strides both policy-wise and then just kind of on a more general inclusion or welcoming level um, to bring these people into mainstream Jewish communities. Um, but I wasn't hearing a lot about how transgender individuals had fared, and that just got me curious looking into whether trans people were also being included in mainstream Jewish life. Um, and we did some research. Um, I had a lot of help in the beginning and um, realized that it was really kind of a mixed bag, that there had been, um, you know, some major breakthroughs, um, including, you know, what Joy, what Joy did, and then there had been a lot of um, difficult setbacks for a lot of people. And so the book uh, aimed to kind of tell that story um, through looking at the question of inclusion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What was the response to, some, to the, the series that you guys did? I, I heard from a lot of people who said, thank you for getting it right, which was really nice. Um, and we also felt like there was a lot more to do. You know, we covered a few different major topics, like trans people in the rabbinate, um, trans people in conversion to Judaism, which there's actually a large community of trans people who are converts, and also um, issues of how, you know, traditional Jewish ritual can be used to both facilitate and honor gender transition. But there was even more to do. So our book includes like a piece on Jewish death rites and gender transition, um, and, and a few others too. Mm -hmm. Now, Joy, um, what has it been like for you? as a transgender member of the, um, the Jewish community? Uh, well, it's been quite a ride. Obviously, I've been a transgender member of the Jewish community my whole life, but most of that time uh, I was in hiding. So most of my life was based on the assumption that if I were openly trans, I would be rejected by and excluded from the Jewish community. So when I, um, when I sent my coming out letter to my dean, I assumed, and I think my dean also assumed, that there would be no way that I could come back and teach um, that uh, people, quote unquote, people would not accept me. And when I met with the dean, um, she said specifically students and their parents won't accept um, someone like you. And I said, well, what about in a few years? And she said, well, maybe in a generation or two. And I was there um, a year later. So both of us misread the, um, the range of possibility 
in the Orthodox Jewish world. Uh, it was easier for me to come back to Stern for a number of reasons. One is New York City is one of the places in the country, and th there really are not, there, most of the country is not like this, where gender identity and expression are protected by a human rights law. So I had that legal protection. I had the legal protection of tenure. All those were pressures. Also because, this seems sort of stupid to say, but it's actually pretty important, because I'm physically relatively small, um, that means that I don't read as gender incoherent. So a lot of trans women, if you don't meet the you know usual physical parameters of um, you know what people think of as female, um, it's much much harder to be accepted. And I suspect that if I'd been six foot tall, um, they would have paid me whatever it took to make me go away, rather than have me come back. And finally, I think that it was important that I wasn't orthodox. So I didn't really pay much attention to the kind of negative reactions to my return. And instead, I was just um, astonished by the miracle of the other reactions. Mm -hmm. So I didn't take personally when rabbis um, said that I shouldn't be there, but I was, um, I was so delighted both about Judaism and about um, humanity that there were so many voices in the Orthodox community that said, you know, we don't really understand what this is, but some people said, we do recognize um, human beings in pain, and Judaism teaches us that we need to respond with compassion when people are in pain. We need to treat people respectfully, whether we understand them or not. So as those voices were lifted up, saying that these are the core values of Orthodox Judaism and Judaism, I thought, you know what, I'm not Orthodox, but that's a Judaism that I can really sign on to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, uh, you wrote the foreword to this ebook, um, and in the foreword, um, you, d you said something to the effect that this is the birth of the future, you know, and I thought that was really significant. What did you mean by that when you said that? Um, this is the beginning of a movement toward a future in which it's just recognized that any given Jewish community is going to include people with variant gender identity and expression, just the way it's becoming pretty rapidly acknowledged that any Jewish community is going to include gay or lesbian or bisexual people. Actually, the bisexual thing, I think we're not there yet. Right. But recognizing that this is part of a normal range of variation and then deciding what to do about it is different than where we have been, which is um, communities not even knowing that this was a possibility and reacting with shock and confusion when it um, when it comes up. So I'm on the board of Keshet, which is a national organization that works toward full inclusion of gay, lesbian, and bisexual, and transgender Jews in the Jewish world. And we get calls all the time from Jewish organizations saying, somebody just came out as transgender, like in middle school. One of our students just came out as transgender. What do we do? And Keshet um, actually provides educational materials and trainings, and until recently there wasn't anyone to call. I mean, you, the normal response would just be, let's get rid of that person, or pretend that they're not there at all. So I think that this is the beginning, very uneven and difficult beginning, but nonetheless the beginning of a profound change in the way the Jewish community understands itself. Mm -hmm. Naomi, in, in your introduction to the book as well, you mentioned the fact that, you know, in your research you were you were on very specific websites where you know the conversation was being had, mm -hmm. but now is it something that there's a broader conversation that's being had about about the um, the transgender community? I definitely think there's a broader conversation happening, but I should add that this, so the conversation about the role of um, trans people in Judaism has always been happening. It just seemed to be happening more among trans people mm -hmm. themselves, and so there are you know, synagogues in the Bay Area where there are, you know, a huge number of trans people who are talking about gender issues in Judaism. Um, I think what's new is seeing, like, more mainstream um, Jewish spaces taking on this issue, whether it's summer camps, synagogues, rabbinical school. There's definitely no rule book for when someone comes out as trans at summer camp, they have to go in on the boy side or the girl side. Right. There, it's, it's really, I think, a case-by-case -case situation. Mm -hmm. And so, as more trans people are coming out um, in 
everywhere beyond the Jewish world, the Jewish world is also dealing with these questions. Now, just to get back to th to the book specifically, mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about the stories that you guys uh, that you're telling in the in the in the book. Uh, could you just tell me a little bit about the different stories that y in the sure. In the, in the, yeah. So, um, one big reported piece that I did was profiling um, the six people who are rabbis or are rabbis in training who are trans. Um, there are probably more. These are six people who are out and have been very vocal. And they're all over the country, and they're, nobody is in orthodoxy, but they're in different denominations, reform and reconstructionist, um, and I think one conservative ordained rabbi. Um, and then we have several personal pieces, um, and then uh, we have another piece about um, Tahara, which is um, Jewish burial rites, and how to honor somebody's gender after death, and how can a, t and this is a really, I think you could speak to this too, Joy, uh, from what I understand, you've done research on this topic. It's a very, very intimate um, set of rituals. Psalms are sung over the body, mm -hmm. and um, what it amounts to is assuring the person that even though they're dead, even though what makes them a person has been gone, their community is going to hold them in their humanness and continue to see them as human. And as a trans person, that profoundly spoke to me, the idea that even though you can't recognize what's human about what's in front of you, you as a community are going to nonetheless honor that humanness. And the Psalms sing about how beautiful the, the person is. And um, so I, you know, it's a challenge because it is such a heavily divided by sex ritual. You know, women are supposed to deal with female bodies and men are supposed to deal with male bodies out of um, respect. And so when you have bodies that don't fall into those kinds of categories. I'm, uh, I'm so moved that for men, a number of years in a row, this National Society's uh, annual conference has included uh, talks by trans people about, um, about the issues that are involved. So they, they are um, working on educating communities. And um, I think that that really is still a work in progress, but it's, um, it's a testament to the people who do this work tend to be know, fairly conservative. They're preserving traditions that many Jews no longer honor anymore. Um, but their commitment to treating um, uh, people who are dead with respect is so great that it's leading them beyond um, the kinds of uh, prejudices and questions that they might have. Like, well, we've never thought about other genders. And that is, you know, why I see hope in terms of the Jewish future, because to the extent that Judaism plants respect for the human being at the core of the tradition. I feel that that keeps leading us beyond our limitations and the limitations of our community and challenging us to have a more embracing vision of what it is to be human. Joy, uh, really fascinating speaking with you and meeting you today. And Naomi, really great work on the pieces. Thank you guys both for being with us. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. Wonderful. Yeah. The ebook Transgender and Jewish, is currently available on Amazon.com for download. Still to come on the show, an outcry for more help for non-English speaking families dealing with autism. Before that, Abby Shola has some other news. Thanks, Zyphus. Here's a look at some headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. From Color Lines, public schools in New York are the most segregated according to a new study. The UCLA Civil Rights Project finds that in 2009, blacks and Latinos in New York State occupied the most racially segregated public schools in the country. New York City, the largest public school district, boasted the highest numbers. Typically, black and Latino students in the city attend schools with majority students of color, while many white students attend schools where only 10% of the student body are black. Researchers say the separation is due largely to New York City's residential segregation of blacks, Latinos, and whites. A Brooklyn Assemblywoman is pushing new legislation that will make it harder to close long-term assisted living facilities. Assemblywoman Joan Millman is leading a group of advocates who are proposing a law that would stop future closures of long-term care facilities. She proposes that a nine-member commission be appointed to decide over the course of one year whether a facility could close. This after 130 senior citizens who are wheelchair-bound, battling dementia, and other ailments were given 90 days to vacate their assisted living facility in Park Slope, Brooklyn. That from the Brooklyn Eagle. The Chinese practice of curing meat at home is sparking an online debate. 
though Chinese supermarkets and restaurants sell cured meat. It's still common to see pork, fish, and duck hanging outside of windows or in the yards of Chinese residents. According to World Journal, a netizen recently posted photos of their neighbor's cured meat online. Many left comments saying the photos were scary. Others said Chinese who cure meat outside of their homes need to adapt to living in America by keeping their surroundings clean. On the other hand, there are health concerns for curing meat at home. Experts say it might not meet hygienic standards, and it's better to buy it from vendors who are monitored by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And finally, women are the focus for a new cross-genre art and literature journal. DNAinfo.com reports that No Tokens, a new biannual literary journal that will promote women's voices, recently launched in Williamsburg. The magazine will feature poetry, fiction, nonfiction, painting, and drama. The journal's editor-in-chief, Kira Madden, says they will include a balanced number of male and female contributors. They also decided to distribute No Tokens in print, although most art and literature publications are now published digitally. Those were just a few headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. Independent sources will be back right after this. Thanks for staying tuned. Autism and Autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD, are both terms used to describe a group of complex disorders of the brain. The disorders are characterized by difficulty in communicating, in forming relationships with other people, and in using language and abstract concepts. Statistics from the Centers for Disease Control reveal that the number of children dealing with the disease has nearly doubled in the last 10 years. It's a tough road for parents, made even tougher in some cases by a language barrier. Sarah Pizan spoke about this issue with Gina Peña Campodonico, an autism awareness advocate, and Hisela Sanders Alcantara, a CUNY TV producer who's documented her own struggles as her son deals with the disorder. Gina, Hisela, thank you for being with us today. Before we get started, I'd like to view this clip from the upcoming episode of Nueva York that deals with the issue of autism in the Hispanic community. I asked if, for being Mexican, my experience would be different. I came to the teacher and my son, who was already at that time going to a special school of education. I think as many as six million immigrant children have language deficits, including autism. But almost all research is done on the European-American homes and families. You have, you have to meet all these bullets in order for you to be typical. And in your culture, you may not have these same bullets. Tal vez por esa razón, hay personas que no se diagnostican o se les identifica más tarde, como fue el caso de Simón. So in the clip we just saw, it seems that um, autism education and literacy in this country has mostly been done in English. So, Gina, why is that? Spanish-speaking professionals are not as readily accessible as, as others are. Or maybe it's a, it's, um, it's a lack of effort. I really don't know. Because there are professionals that is, who speak Spanish. I know that. I mean, there are plenty of them. But uh, I think it's, it's a matter of putting together the, the Spanish-speaking professionals and the agencies that provide the services for the children. So what's currently being done in Hispanic communities now for, for autism? What's available? Um, well, most the problem is that some of the families do not yet speak the language. Um, I realized while I was working that that was the case. Therefore, I did what I needed to do once I, I, I was able to, like I am now. Uh, what is it being done? I, I worked for an agency that, um, that is bilingual to begin with. And um, we, have pro we didn't have problems to access um, translation. The translation was excellent, but it's never the same as it is uh, a real engagement between two people. You know, you always get like a second, um, like a derived type of thing, regardless of how good the translation is. There is a separation between the speaker and, and the person that is listening to or attending to these particular workshops. Isela, yeah. what was your experience like? Um, well, um, to begin with, you know, you are somebody that is not from here, you know, so you're, uh, you are, are always behind in every single way, you know. So um, I am married to an American guy. We had a beautiful boy, and he was not really talking when he was three. And we thought that that, that was because we were a bilingual, you know, household, and that he would 
you know, start talking later. You know, we didn't, we we're not really rushing. So I guess maybe that was kind of like a, a key difference, you know. We were not rushing. Uh, we were not kind of like on board trying to get services for him because we thought he didn't need them, you know, just because, you know, he's bilingual. He'll st start talking later. And, um, you know, we just didn't question it. Um, how did you how did you realize that your son might have autism? What were kind of like the symptoms that raised questions to you? Well, of course, you know, um, talking later is one of them. But because we were not considering it, we you know we we didn't we actually didn't really realize that um, he had autism until the teachers approached us and said, you know, you have to get your kid evaluated. We just felt that our kid was unique. And you know he didn't talk, uh, play with other kids. He would tend to repeat uh, the same lines uh, on a book or of a, a movie or maybe the alphabet. You know he would go from A to Z all through the day. You know chanting the whole day without really interacting with other kids. So I think that was kind of like one of the you know few of the elements. But again, you know he he had a lot of you know, sensory issues that we weren't really not aware of. He was our first kid, so again, we were not really catch, catching any anything, really. You know, it was really their teachers, the ones who really call our attention t towards that. Gina, so what are some of the symptoms of children with autism? Are there common behaviors? Well, um, the major thing that is spoken about and that it does happen is that the children with autism are not able to engage uh, the parents or anyone visually, um, especially t through the eyes. Um, that can be different later on in life. I mean, if people work with that. Um, they have a lot, like Gisela said, um, a lot of um, sensory issues having to do with, with light, sound, sometimes clothing. The sensibility is incredibly pronounced and, and increased incredibly much more than, than the rest of us. Um, in many cases, there are um, issues with the digestive system, not always, but sometimes they are. So the, the allergies had to be determined by particular types of uh, exams in, in many cases. Um, what else do you sell? Well, I, I, I would say that the range is really wide because, you know, autism is something that, you know, we have to emphasize is, is that each individual lives in a completely different way. Uh, but again, you know, just kind of like supporting what uh, Gina is saying is definitely it's a social, you know, impairment. You know, you have difficulty understanding what's going on around you, you, you know, catching social cues. And then, you, and then thereafter, of course, it's going to be hard for you really to, to respond or, 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 or even to replicate, you know, th those social cues. What about Isela? What was it like for you when you found out your, your child had autism? Was it, you know, because you said that there's, in the Hispanic community, it's hard to find uh, awareness and, and, you know, literacy on it. So what was it like for you? What did you do? Well, of course, you know, you go online and you, you find all this information in English. And uh, most of the information, it's pretty harsh, I would say. So, of course, the first reaction is, shock you know like you are like oh my god that is horrible you know and so i would say kind of like after digesting and after realizing that well it's my son it's the same one before diagnosis and after diagnosis so uh, it's still my kid you know after all and i guess there is a there is an emphasis and that's what we've been doing with gina about uh, as well you know underlining the positive aspects of uh, having somebody under the spectrum, you know, um, there is. It's of course, it, it's uh, it's a life-changing life experience, definitely. But as well, you, you know, it can open to 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 discover what are the strengths in your in your child, and not only your not only their difficulties, because of course they do have challenges. Of course they do have difficulties. But if you want to uh, tune in. There are a lot of strengths as well that you definitely have to underline because every individual has a strengths and you have to focus on that. You know. D tell us a little bit about um, your segment, your your piece for for Nueva York. You know what pushed you to to do this piece because you're featured in it. It's your personal life right. as well. So t 
tell us why you did that. This is something so prevalent and, you know, the numbers keep growing, which in a way, you know, I like, I like to look at it in a positive in a positive way because that means that it's better diagnosed and it's better you can people are finding it better that's what that's what it means you know so then uh, we are having uh, more uh, tools to treat all all the young and adults that are affected by autism so what really really pushed me to is uh, I want to put a better light into autism not only emphasize the, drama the dramatism, not only emphasize how horrible it could be, you know, because that's ha that hasn't has, has been my experience, you know. In my experience, you know, autism is, 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 it could be as well, you know, could have a good light. What happens to the child? Is there something that can help him or her in, uh, with, you know, with the disorder? A lot of one-on-one, -on -one. a lot of, you know, playtime, a lot of, you know, of course, uh, you know, getting getting services through the Department of Education, through insurance, if you have, and that's actually another problem with the, with the Hispanic community. A lot of us just don't have access to health insurance, you know, or you don't know how to fight for the services that your child deserves, mm -hmm. you know, because the Department of Education is obligated, you know, to give services to your child. Sometimes people don't know how to fight for it. You know, how to, don't know how to navigate the system. The system is already complicated for an English speaker. So imagine a Spanish speaker who, you know, do not have a lawyer, might not have money to pay for one. So it's just not easy, you know, for for an individual, you know, to to navigate that. So I would say, you know, if you have access and you have money and you can get ther a therapist amazing if not just a lot of one-on-one -on -one, a lot of you know playtime a lot of you know trying to get your child to connect to, to you and of course there are like a lot of uh, strategies you know that a therapist can can give you and that's why we you know have our group to give each other you know uh, tips mm -hmm. into what I have done to my my child that doesn't mean that it's gonna what I've done with my child is gonna help with others you know you really you know, uh, again, every individual is different, but it might help, you know. So you try it, and if you don't try it, then you can, like, start trying something different, you know. And as well, we, br we brought to the group a uh, therapist, a speech pathologist, that have, uh, uh, you know, given us, uh, you know, like, strategies on how to work with our kids. Well, thank you so much for being with us, Isela and Gina. Thank you. Thank you. You can see more of Hisela's piece and learn more about what's being done to assist Hispanic parents dealing with autism when the Nueva York special premieres on CUNY TV on Thursday, April 3rd at 10 a.m. We'll be right back. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded. <laughs>